Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Sam Chadwick, and I'm in the innovation team at Thomson Reuters, and I'm accompanied by Tim Nugent, who is in our research and development team. Um, and we thought we'd spend today talking about some of the things that Thomson Reuters has been doing over the last two years in the Ethereum space. Um, but we thought we'd start because uh, over the last couple of days, I've realized that not a lot of you know what, uh, or who Tom Thomson Reuters are. Um, we are famous for our Reuters news agency that delivers news to over a billion people around the planet every day. Um, but what you may not be aware of is that the majority of our business comes from uh, three business units where we are a trusted information provider for uh, professional services across financial and risk, tax and accounting and legal. So our journey here started uh, a couple of years ago um, because I'm based in Zug, uh, which as Uport mentioned has been coined as Crypto Valley now. Um, and I'd gone back to study uh, a, a degree at Oxford um, and was, was hunting for a dissertation topic. Um, and Vitalik's paper came out uh, and a lot of the people or media were picking it up saying, well, this is going to disrupt the financial services tremendously. Um, and given that a large proportion of our revenue comes from the financial services business, the question was, well, how's that going to impact us? So of course, um, not knowing where Ethereum was based, I reached out to Vitalik. Uh, these were the days before he was famous. So uh, he was very happy to answer my email, fortunately. Um, and we met up for a coffee in Zug. Um, I had no idea that he lived two kilometers down the road from me. Uh, he more or less said very quickly, you guys need to be an oracle. The financial services industry trusts you. You're an information provider. Um, and we need to bring those capabilities to Ethereum. So the journey really started there. And as I was looking at the space, the question became, so what part of financial services is likely to get impacted first? So we put together a model uh, that we call the three Vs model, uh, volume, value, and venue. Uh, you can't see the venue axis. That's going in and out of the page, but it's essentially uh, the, the difference between centralized and decentralized venues. But on the axes that I've decided to talk about today, you've got um, value on the y-axis and volume of transactions on the x-axis. So if you look at the top right corner, so this is the global capital segment, foreign exchange, public equity exchanges, government bonds. These are incredibly sophisticated uh, markets today, decades worth of improvements, Yes, people point at them and say they work inefficiently, but actually the time and effort it's going to take to migrate those industries and those markets is quite considerable. So we're not saying it won't happen. We're just saying that probably that won't be the place where it starts first. So if you go to the opposite end, this is the retail space, peer-to-peer -peer lending, music royalties, gambling. Um, You've seen a lot of startups at starting to attack this space. It's really interesting. There's a lot of activity here. It's not really a space for Thomson Reuters. It's not one that we play in today. So in the bottom right, you've got the machine age. And this, I think, will be a huge opportunity for blockchain technologies. Uh, Internet of Things, we're already seeing companies like Gollum with distributed computation and IXEC downstairs. So for us, we felt this was a bit early. Um, we started doing this analysis, as I mentioned, almost two years ago. So the question became, what about this last segment? These are the big ticket items. High value, low volume transactions, venture capital, private equity, over-the-counter derivatives, syndicated loans. This was where we decided to focus our effort. This was the markets, these are the markets that we believe were gonna move first. So having sat down with Vitalik and him having told me, well, we really need an oracle, I thought that rather than just believe him outright, um, let's have a think about what data would be needed from an off-chain provider like us. So looking at the conditional transaction dependencies, you can obviously create lots of smart contract opportunities using on-chain data. Doesn't really need an oracle, the data's already there that you can reference. 
But as we looked more and more, we realized that he was indeed right. We should, probably shouldn't have doubted him. Uh, and the majority of opportunities are actually those that require off-chain data. And I think in the last two years since we did this, um, that hypothesis has been validated over and over. So we looked at all of these and thought, you know, the, probably the space to start is benchmarked and values for derivatives, given that that fell squarely into that top left quadrant from the previous slide. So we created a capability that we've called Block 1 IQ. Block 1 IQ is an oracle. It's in beta, but it's live, and it works, and it's compatible with both Corda and Ethereum. Uh, we've been talking with the JP Morgan guys about making extending compatibility to Quorum as well, but uh, that shouldn't be very much effort at all. And the data sets we've started with are share prices, so exchange, uh, public exchange equity data, foreign exchange data, corporate actions, which are things like mergers, buybacks, stock splits, dividends, coupons, anything where there's a change. Cryptocurrency rates from our uh, partner company, uh, Crypto Compare. Um, financial benchmarks, so these are things like LIBOR rates that a lot of the derivatives around the world today reference. And then the knowledge graph, which I won't discuss now, but I'll come back to you later. So the problem facing us was slightly different to some of the other Oracle players that are following us later today, in that they needed to create trust first. But customers already trust us. We're the trusted information provider for the majority of the financial services industry. So our problem was slightly different. It's been around enabling the Ethereum community with high quality trusted data. So this is the place we've chosen to start. We can only support today non-production uh, POCs run on private ledgers. I know this is a limitation, we're working on this, but a majority of the problems for us uh, reside around content licensing barriers. So when you look at Block 1 IQ, we ask for you to think about creating a consortium, a group of organizations that are gonna use this as opposed to just reaching out to try and kick the tires. And I should add that it's free. We're not charging anything for this. We want to enable you guys to see what you can do with it. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Tim, who's gonna show you a bit more about the capabilities. Right, thank you, Sam. So uh, this is essentially the landing page for Block One IQ at the moment. Uh, so if you visit this site, you can uh, download some architectural schemes, uh, APIs, uh, documentation, and some other downloads. And actually, and so this is the, uh, the Thomson Reuters developer communi community website. And if you click around, actually, there's some links to some other APIs that we offer. So last year, I demonstrated another offering, uh, something called Block One I ID, which is essentially a, 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 an identity resolution system which connects Ethereum addresses with OAuth2 credentials. So if you click around, you can also find that. Um, so have a look around this website. When you're ready to sign up, you'll be faced with this page. Um, we ask that you sign up to certain terms and conditions. Uh, most of the data that you will have access to is proprietary, um, and in many cases, uh, we license it from third parties. Um, so fill in all the, all the details, tell us a little bit about your project and your, your, your plans. And when you click Submit, I think Sam will get a, a notification. Uh, there'll be some legal documentation that may need to be attended to. Uh, if everything goes through, you will receive uh, access and a login to our self-serve system. Um, so this is our self-serve system. It's very much a work in progress, um, but this allows us to do some sort of onboarding and whitelisting of your contracts. So very simply, just to, to add a few users, you can do that here by adding names, emails, and setting whether they are a user or an admin, uh, for example. Uh, 
do that, and then you, you click through, you get to this bit where you can configure your deployment. So I think as Sam mentioned, this service is only available for private chains at the moment. So put in your deployment name, other details, for example, RPC host, RPC port, um, a default account. Click through, and you can see what the configuration looks like. Now, from this page, uh, it gets a bit more interesting. If you, if you hit the orange button, this allows you to add a contract. So say you have a trade contract, uh, you can click on that button, put in the address of that contract. And what essentially happens here is, is that address is being whitelisted with our service. So our Oracle contract will see that the, the request for data has come from a whitelisted contract. And as long as it's, on, as it's on that whitelist, we will be able to send data back to you. You can also click on the contracts button and you can see the list of the contracts you've added and you can edit that. Um, once you've set that, up, set that up, the Oracle contract address will also be visible, so you will know the address to hit with your requests. Um, there's also a little test interface, so you can test uh, requesting and receiving data. So we've got a, a very small sample of the, of, the, of the different requests you can make, so end of day prices, intraday, uh, interest rates, uh, cryptocurrency rates. So select your, your symbol from the, from the drop down, um, hit submit, and a block later the, the data will come back. And here it's simply represented as a JSON object. Um, if you go and look at our API, you can, you can be quite selective with, um, with exactly what you request and exactly what is returned. And you can tailor, tailor that to, to, to the needs of your smart contract. Um, so that's pretty much the self-service, quite straightforward. Uh, on our roadmap is to provide an API which will expose most of this functionality such that registering smart contracts uh, uh, and, uh, with our Oracle can all be done quickly off-chain. So just to make this a little bit more tangible, a couple of examples of some, uh, some assets that we've modeled uh, to demonstrate interactivity uh, with our Oracle. So this is, this is an equity swap contract. Um, uh, it essentially has two legs, uh, uh, an interest rate leg and an equity leg. So there are two sort of uh, streams of payment here. One is based on the performance of an equity. So here, uh, the S&P 500 or, or an equity index, as the case may be. And on the other leg, it's typically based on an interest rate, which in this case is LIBOR. Um, so when the contract uh, is instantiated um, by either party A or party B, at the moment the request to the Oracle is made on-chain, uh, but we're adapting our, our functionality so that could be made via a signed message off-chain. But at the point of instantiation, a request is sent to our Oracle, and in this case it will request uh, two symbols, uh, the S&P 500, SPX, and also LIBOR. And you can configure how regularly you want the, the response data to come back. It could be an end of day, or it could be a, a, a single point in the future. Um, so when this data is delivered by our Oracle, uh, the two values, the SPX and LIBOR, are updated. And these values are used to calculate the, the value of the two legs. So with the equity leg, um, this will be based on uh, the notional, which is a, a trade parameter you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, and it will be the notional multiplied by the percentage change in the S&P 500. Um, for the interest rate leg, that is essentially uh, LIBOR plus uh, basis points, which is another one of these uh, trade parameters, um, and, and the tenor here is essentially the duration of the trade. So using the, the values from our Oracle, uh, the value of these two legs can be calculated, and here we have a very simple uh, ERC-20 uh, settlement. So you can see how the, the prices that arrive from our Oracle uh, further down the line drive the movement of these tokens to settle these two legs. Um, slightly more elaborate one here. So this is a, a, an ERC-20 token basket. Um, so this might be an actively managed uh, contract or, or basket of, of ERC-20 tokens. So at the bottom left, you have a manager. Uh, the manager will assign weights to the tokens held within the basket. Um, at the point of assigning these weights, this request is sent uh, on-chain or off-chain to our Oracle saying, essentially, this, this contract requests the, the price, the values of these specific tokens. So these tokens and, and other cryptocurrency values come from crypto compare, as Sam mentioned. When those values arrive, uh, they are, the, those, those values are used in combination with the allocations that are currently held to call this valuation function. And using this valuation function, we can, we can come up with a, we can calculate a value for the overall uh, uh, token basket. Uh, depending on performance, whether things go well or go badly, uh, investors who are these parties, ABC, down at the bottom, can either invest or withdraw Ether. And depending on, on, on that investment, 
um, using a hook out to your favorite uh, decentralized exchange protocol. Uh, uh, tokens can either be purchased or sold to keep the allocation in check. Right, so that's it from me. Uh, I will pass back to Sam, who will talk about some of our learnings from these experience, experiences and also uh, a little bit about our future roadmap. Great, thanks, Tim. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, I think going through this over the last couple of years, I mean, Tim was here this time last year, um, or in Shanghai, rather, uh, talking about Block 1 ID. Um, and this was one of the biggest learning points as we set forward into looking at how we make our content available. And for those of you that weren't here last year, this is Block 1 ID. It was a capability that we had to create in order to honor the content licensing and permissioning arrangements that we're responsible for as we distribute content that we aggregate uh, through to the ultimate consumer. Um, Block One ID is essentially an address mapping service. So slightly different to some of the other identity capabilities that you've heard from. Um, but it means that we can take an OAuth address like Google, Twitter, LinkedIn, and map it to an Ethereum address. And therefore, we know and uh, DAP developers know when a user is returning that they are, through a pop-up, asked to authenticate themselves and then you know that that's the same user coming back even if they have different Ethereum addresses that they're using. So this was the first step. It was around identity of users in order to honor content licensing. The second learning point was around identifiers. So if I asked you what the ticker symbol C stands for today, then you would be right if you answered Citigroup. But if I had asked you that same question in 1998, the answer would have been Chrysler. And the problem is that these tickers across the financial services industry get recycled. And if you're writing smart contracts using these, that's an absolute nightmare um, because you can't change your smart contract. So we created an open capability. It's called a PermID. And you can all access it today at permid.org. It essentially creates permanent identifiers for entities, which means you can always reference that number and always have confidence that it's going to return the information that you require, even if the industry symbols are recycled. So take a look at permid.org. It doesn't have to be blockchain related. This is open and works for everything, and it's available under a Creative Commons license. So I'll finish in the last minute with what's next. So firstly, we're looking to expand data coverage. I mentioned a few uh, um, earlier, but we're already having organizations come to us now and saying, can you please add electricity prices, natural gas prices, other commodities information? We've had interest in supply chain in general. And so as my request out to you, or my first request out to you, is if uh, you have needs for other content sets, then do come and talk to us. It's not limited to what we've shown in this first beta. That was just a place to start. And secondly, we have a capability called KYC as a service. We do this for all the banks already. And one of our hypotheses is, can we be a KYC service for investors, for initial coin offerings, for advisors, for law firms? Can you take advantage of the capabilities that we have that we would test, traditionally test, use test. in banks and use those same capabilities and data and information in your identity activities. So if you think that's appealing, please come and talk to me, because that's something that we're thinking about working on right now. <laughs>